In rock and roll, there is a saying, live fast, die young, leave a beautiful corpse. This saying rang true for Sid Vicious and Nancy Spudgeon. Punk rock evolved from the garage bands of the 1960s to a worldwide audience in the 1970s. Bands like the Ramones and The Clash gained worldwide success on a message of bucking the system and flipping the bird to authority. While these two bands were highly influential, there was one other that gained worldwide notoriety, the Sex Pistols, a band that only lasted two years and only had one album. From the ashes of a band called The Strand, the band that would be known as the Sex Pistols would go through some changes before their final 1975 lineup. Johnny Rotten, lead vocals. Steve Jones on guitar. Paul Cook on drums. And Glenn Matlock on bass. The band hit the punk scene and gained a cult following, including one of their hangers-on, which was a kid by the name of John Simon Ritchie. Born on May 10, 1957, Richie didn't have the most stable upbringing. Born to Annie McDonald, Richie's father John was never in his life. His mother Anne had met his father when she was in the British Armed Services. She moved John Simon and herself to Ibiza, Spain, thinking that her husband John would follow soon after. But they were deserted, and Anne began to sell pot to get by. The thing about Anne was, she wasn't just selling drugs. She was doing them too. She would end up addicted to heroin and opiates, and at times doing them in front of her son. She was less of a mother and more tried to be like a friend to her son. And drugged out, she wasn't much of that either. John Ritchie was known as a good kid, soft-spoken and kind-hearted. By his teens though, he was into drugs as well, injecting himself with amphetamines, which was his drug of choice. He also became a heavy fixture in the punk rock scene, having a bombastic personality due to uppers that he was taking. It wasn't long till he became known as the life of the party. In 1973, he took the name Sid Vicious. The name came from the time that the now Sid was bitten by Johnny Rotten's hamster, which was also named Sid. Sid ended up commenting that the hamster was vicious. In 1976, the band signed with EMI Records. Sid wasn't a part of the band just yet but the single Anarchy in the UK was written and recorded during this time. And an incident happened on live television that would give the band a lot more notoriety. Queen's Freddie Mercury had been scheduled to be on a British television program called Today, which was hosted by Bill Grundy. But Freddie had to drop out due to a dental appointment. So the Sex Pistols were given the time slot. What would transpire was a profanity-laced interview that garnered the headline, The Filth and the Fury by the Daily Mirror. Glenn Matlock would leave the band in February of 1977, and that was when Sid joined the band. And well, he had to play bass. The problem was, Sid didn't know how to play bass, but Sid's natural charisma and shocking antics fit the band perfectly. When high off of his ass, he would be unpredictable on stage, including times he ended up bleeding and writing things on his chest. EMI Records had dropped them, but they found new hope with a and Records. On March 10th of 1977, they recorded God Save the Queen. Success for Sid came with a heightened drug addiction. Though he'd never tried it before, he became addicted to heroin, thanks to a girl he met in December of 1976, a girl named Nancy Spudgeon. Nancy Spudgeon was born on February 27th, 1958, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and she really didn't have the best start in life. She was born with cyanosis and almost died. Her umbilical cord was wrapped around her throat when she was delivered. But she would recover and surprisingly was a very intelligent young girl. She would walk and talk before she was a year old. But she did have issues. At three months old, her parents would give her liquid barbiturates due to her having screaming fits. Fits that never went away. Into early childhood, she would still have temper tantrums. She was also violent and dangerous to her younger sister, Susan, but not to her younger brother, surprisingly. By age 11, she had been expelled from school. She also had a habit of trying to slash her own wrist purely to get attention. At 15, she was diagnosed with schizophrenia. At 14, she tried heroin for the first time and became addicted to it. By 17, she left home and became a groupie for bands like Aerosmith, Bad Company, and the New York Dolls. 
She was also a drug dealer and a sex worker. She would be the one these bands would go to for a good time or a fix. In 1976, she discovered the Sex Pistols and she made a plan that she wanted to have sex with Johnny Rotten. So she flew to London with a band called the Heartbreakers. But she did not end up betting Johnny Rotten. But she did with Sid Vicious. And the two fell into a codependent love affair. She provided him with drugs, got him hooked on heroin, and showed him a good time. He gave her a rock and roll lifestyle that she wanted. And the other members of the Sex Pistols began to notice her ever-growing influence over Sid Vicious. Sid became so addicted to heroin that the band members had to take steps to keep him clean for tours. Everything from trying to keep Nancy away from him, which worked for the UK tour, to having roadies follow him into bathrooms. They even attempted to kidnap Nancy, put her on a plane back to the United States, just to keep her away from Sid. None of this worked. In fact, she was so unpopular with the band and fans that she was christened Nauseating Nancy. On January 18, 1978, the band played their last gig in San Francisco. Halfway through their U.S. tour, the band broke up, and Nancy was seen as the Yoko Ono of that group. Sid, without a band, without revenue, and a severely bad drug addiction was looking for what to do next. He was thinking of going solo and putting on his own music, with Nancy as his manager. The two would book a room at the Chelsea Hotel in New York City, where they partied and did a lot of drugs. The situation was spiraling out of control, to the point that they were forced to move rooms because they, in a drug-filled stupor, ended up setting fire to a bed, and things were just going to get worse. Nancy believed that she would never live to see her 21st birthday, and that prophecy came true. October 11th, 1978. In their hotel room, Sid and Nancy hosted a party where the drugs and alcohol flowed. Sid had taken 30 pills of whose name I cannot pronounce, but it was pretty much ambient. So Sid was so out of it by the early evening that he was passed out on the bed. People came and went all night. By 5 a.m., the last couple of people left without incident. At some point, an actor and comedian named Rockets Red Glare, which is a really weird name, but okay, was asked by Nancy to go score some drugs for her. As he left, he passed another drug dealer coming into the building. I mention this because what happened to Nancy is still unknown, and this is one of the many stories of what happened that night. That morning around 8 a.m., a woman in a room neighboring Sid and Nancy's reported hearing moaning as if someone was injured and looking for help. She didn't hear any type of struggle, just the sounds of a person dying. She didn't think anything of it until around 11 a.m. when she reported it to staff. Now, I have heard two stories on what happens next. Wikipedia states that staff walked into the room and found Nancy dead in the bathroom under the sink. The other states that the staff didn't get a chance to walk into the room. Sid woke up and found Nancy laying under the bathroom sink with a knife wound in her stomach. That knife was cleaned and any fingerprints were wiped off. What is known is the wound wasn't deep enough to be life-threatening, if she got help in time. She ended up bleeding out, dying at the age of 20. And since he was in the room, the prime suspect was Sid Vicious. After the discovery of the body, Sid was found outside the room in the hall, pacing back and forth. He was hysterical. One minute he would say he didn't know what happened. Another minute he would say that he stabbed his baby. It was clear that he was in a panic state. So police showed up and interviewed him in the hall. But seeing how he was drawing attention to himself and telling police he didn't know what happened, he was led to a conference room where he tried to come up with scenarios on what could have happened. For instance, she could have rolled over on the knife. Police continued to interrogate him until he blurted out, I stabbed her. I didn't mean to kill her. I loved her, but she treated me like shit. Which was true. They would be violent with one another. They would break up with one another and then get back together. Like I said, it was a codependent relationship. The police ended up arresting Sid, where he went back to claiming he was innocent. Two days later, he was charged with second-degree murder, given a $58,000 bond, and was bonded out. But not for long. A few weeks later, he got into a bar fight and was sent back to jail, where he was bonded out again for an additional $10,000. On December 9, 1978, he attacked Todd Smith, Patty Smith's brother, at a concert. He would be sent to Rikers Island for a 52-day detox. Then he was released into the custody of Malcolm McLaurin on February 1st, 1975. In 24 hours, he would be dead. Throughout this whole ordeal, 
Sid did interviews, where he stated that he wanted it to die. He was distraught, not knowing if he had been the one to kill Nancy or what had actually happened in that room that night. He was depressed, and as time went on, it did not get better. He loved Nancy, and he thought he had been the one who killed her. And throughout his detox, all he could think about was getting a fix. So when he was released, you would think Malcolm McLaurin would do what he could to keep Sid away from drugs. Now, Malcolm was busy dealing with a lawsuit with the Sex Pistols. So Malcolm left him in the care of his mother, who was still going by her married name, Anne Beverly. And Anne scored him some heroin, which he took, but it was too weak, so he asked a friend that he had run across named Peter Gravel to get him some more heroin. He gave Gravel $200, and Gravel did find more heroin. Sid ended up going to a party at an apartment owned by actress Michelle Robinson. Robinson he had been sleeping with after the death of Nancy. It was there that Sid overdosed for the first time that night. He came out of it as Gravel tried to help him. The first thing Sid wanted was another hit. Gravel tried to dissuade him, but ended up giving him very little. Gravel gave the rest to Anne and then left, telling Anne not to give him any more that night. Sid was also given four quaaludes to help him sleep. The next morning, his mother found him. He had passed away from a drug overdose. He was only 21. There is an alternate story of how Sid died. In this series, The Final 24, a story told by Alan Parker suggested that Anne killed her own son, stating that she had given him a fatal dose of heroin because he was afraid of going back to prison. But, Alan Parker stated that he made this up so that The Final 24 would pay him more. For reference, Anne was dead by the time this episode aired, having died in 1996. So Alan Parker is kind of an asshole for running her name in the mud so that he can make more money. So Alan Parker, if you ever come across this, you're an asshole. But did Sid Vicious kill Nancy Spudgeon? Hard to know for sure. He was out of it all night, blacked out and had enough drugs in his system that if he did, it was in a blacked out state. There are some who posit the theory that Rocket's red glare or a drug dealer killed her. There was money missing from the hotel room. The theory is that the drug dealer or Rockets went into the room, saw the money and tried to steal it, only for Nancy to catch them in the act. So she was stabbed. Not a bad theory. It does make sense. But why stab her in the stomach and so shallow that it wasn't life-threatening? She died from blood loss after hours of suffering. Another one comes from letters left by Sid. To Nancy's family, he wrote a letter saying, We always knew that we would go to the same place when we died. We so much wanted to die together in each other's arms. I cry every time I think about that. I promised my baby that I would myself if anything ever happened to her and she promised me the same this is my final commitment to my love in his jacket pocket a note was found reading we had a death pact and i have to keep my half of the bargain please bury me next to my baby bury me in my leather jacket jeans and motorcycle boots goodbye sid's final wishes were not granted well in the conventional term anyways nancy was buried in a jewish cemetery in pennsylvania sid was cremated and though Anne's request to scatter the ashes over nancy's grave grave was denied, they ended up doing it anyways. The death pact angle also doesn't really work if you think about it. Again, Nancy didn't OD, slash her wrists or anything like that. She was stabbed in the stomach. Sid could have OD'd, but he didn't. She was found in a bathroom away from Sid, so that doesn't seem like a death pact. I think the death pact was something that Sid came up with later. Either way, the questions remain on what happened that night. I'm going with someone entered the room and stabbed her after she caught that person trying to rob them. It makes the most sense. Sid and Nancy are somewhat controversial figures. People dress up as them and think their love story is romantic. It really isn't. These were two kids who lived fast, flew close to the sun, and ended up crashing. One was murdered. The other died from their habits. Sid was once a kind-hearted kid whose life was shaped by sex sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Nancy was a violent woman who wanted one thing, to die young. They brought out the worst in each other, and in the end, one couldn't live without the other. 